Most Bibles point out that the earliest manuscripts don't include this story, and sometimes it appears in Luke instead of in John. However, Jeremy, in 383 AD, did include it in his translation of the Gospel of John, right after chapter 7, where we usually find it today. But I went back to my Revised Standard Version that I was given in 1970 when I was nine years old, and I looked in John, I looked in Luke, it's not even there. So there are some Bibles that don't include this story because these earliest manuscripts, that at least that we have, that are existing, that survived over these past couple thousand years, don't have it. However, Jeremy said that he had many ancient Greek and Latin manuscripts at his disposal in his day that did have this story right there after chapter 7. Ambrose of Milan and also Augustine of Hippo confirmed Jeremy's report. In fact, Augustine said in 403 AD, certain persons of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, fearing, I suppose, lest their wives should be given impunity in sinning, removed from the manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness toward the adulteress, as if he who had said sin no more had granted permission to sin. We also have the Didascalia Apostolorum, which is kind of around uh, 200 to 250 AD, and it also alludes to this story, but the earliest possible mention actually comes from Eusebius. He wrote in his Ecclesiastical History, which is the early 300s, quoting Papias, who circa 110 AD when he referred to a story about Jesus and a woman who was accused of many sins. And Papias had said this story could be found in the Gospel of the Hebrews, but we don't have any Gospel of the Hebrews today, whatever that was. What we can verify is that this is an apostolic story. It came from the time of Jesus, from the time of the Gospels, and it fits snugly right after chapter 7 in the Gospel of John. And actually, John chapter 7 provides the context of the events surrounding the woman caught in adultery, which seems to have taken place during the last year of Jesus' ministry. And it was the Feast of Tabernacles, which was actually the best loved of the yearly festivals. Jewish families throughout the known world would return to Jerusalem and the surrounding area, and they would build these temporary shelters out of leafy boughs and flowers, and they would live in them for a week to celebrate Sukkot the feast booths. And Jesus was also in Jerusalem. But it seems he and his disciples and followers weren't camping in Jerusalem. They went back up to the Mount of Olives each night. Sukkot commemorates God's provision during the Exodus, when the Israelite tribes wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Sukkot lasts seven days, and it begins with the Feast of Ingathering, which celebrates the harvest from all the fields and the orchards and the vineyards and the months of toil on their threshing floors and in their wine presses and olive presses. It's considered a Sabbath. The Feast of Ingathering is a joyful thanksgiving of God's largesse, but it also symbolizes God's salvation to all people one day, when God will gather in all nations to the Lord. And in Jesus' time, this was the people's favorite holiday, and it was full of feasting and singing and enjoyment. So it's against this backdrop that the story of the woman caught in adultery takes place. She's nameless, and she's hauled before Jesus, who's been teaching since early morning in the temple courts, and it soon becomes clear she is merely a prop to entrap Jesus. But Jesus soon turns the tables, taking the attention off the woman and placing it on those who accuse her. And by the end of the story, she and Jesus are alone, and it's her own moment of truth. Now, as you think about this story, think about several groups of people swirling around in Jerusalem. First of all, think about the religious authorities. Most notably, these were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the chief priests. And along with them was their cadre of temple guards, and they were all milling about Jerusalem, keenly aware of the city's heightened sense of religious fervor, but also political unrest. And add that to holiday high spirits. They were on guard and very alert. And they were also searching for a way to eliminate Jesus. The locals, the people who lived in Jerusalem, they knew what was going on between Jesus and the religious rulers. But the pilgrims, they were from out of town. They'd heard of Jesus, probably remembered him from the last festival, but they didn't realize he was under a death warrant. So as Jesus walked through the crowds, 
he would have been able to hear what these various groups of people were saying about him. And his practice was to go to the most public place available, which was the temple. And most likely he went to Solomon's portico, although we know he loves to teach right outside or sometimes even in uh, the court of the women, because that's where everybody could go. It's where people brought their offerings. And so he would teach there and he would preach every day of the festival. And when rabbis taught, they would invariably begin by quoting other famous rabbis and theologians. But when Jesus taught, he would say, truly, I say to you, and his powerful authority amazed the crowds. And each day, the religious rulers were frustrated in their attempts to ensnare Jesus. I mean, the religious authorities had accused Jesus of transgressing Moses' law. And keeping Moses' law was all important because the benefits of God's covenant with Israel hinged on obeying God's commandments. And on each occasion, Jesus would easily turn the tables on him and he'd expose the religious leaders for what they really were. They were hypocrites, pedantic religious men, seemingly bereft of true love for God or of God's people. So finally, one morning, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law thought they had finally come up with the perfect trap. And they dragged this woman caught in illicit sexual activity and they thrust her at Jesus' feet. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such women. What do you say? And they said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Now they were sure they had found a case that would expose Jesus for a fraud. After all, Jesus' own father Joseph had thought to quietly divorce Jesus' mother Mary when Joseph suspected Mary's pregnancy was the result of adultery. Joseph had wanted to avoid public scandal and the people in general just didn't support the death penalty for adultery. But the law of Moses was clear, it was not obscure. There are several passages in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they all address adultery in every detail, and the penalty for adultery almost always was death, and sometimes specifically by stoning. How had she been caught in the very act of committing adultery? Now, it may not have been that the scribes and Pharisees were the ones who arrested her because people routinely took their cases to the elders to adjudicate. So this woman may have first been brought to the religious rulers along with the evidence that was being held against her. Now, the first story that leaps to mind, the one that I've so often heard and I've asked around, this is the one other people hear too, especially during a holiday like the Feast of Booths, when I suppose people could hop from booth to booth if they wanted, but then, you know, there'd be all of these witnesses too. I saw this lady sneak over to that guy's booth. Would have been to just walk in on her. And if she was a betrothed or a married woman, having sex with a man who was not her husband, clearly that would be adultery. And it wouldn't have mattered if the man was also married. The point was, she was married or betrothed. And according to the law of Moses, both of them would be put to death. But, you know, in this case, maybe the man had not been apprehended. Maybe he hadn't been hauled in. The truth is, the law spoke to other situations as well. So sometimes, for example, on the wedding night, a man might accuse his bride of not being a virgin. And if her parents could not provide proof of her virginity, she stood convicted of adultery. And the law also stipulated that if a man thought his wife's pregnancy was not his child, then she would be brought to the temple and made to endure an elaborate ritual involving grain offerings and disheveling her hair and drinking a solution of written curses and dust from the temple floor all dissolved into holy water. If she lost the baby, it was conviction of her guilt. Now, these religious rulers had come to Jesus with hard evidence of her transgression, whatever that evidence was. So whether she'd been seduced 
or taken the initiative, whether her marriage was a good one or a troubled one, whether she was an upstanding citizen or had come from the edge of town, she truly had been committing adultery. She was guilty. And the law of Moses left no room for guilt offerings or for the Day of Atonement or for any other recourse. There was no room for forgiveness. According to the law, her transgression could only be addressed with the death penalty. Now we know from the Gospels that Jesus always read the hearts of the people who came to him. So as we enter into this story, think about what Jesus saw as he looked into the hearts of the guilty woman and her accusers. So let's talk about that, the truth of the heart. Imagine, if you can, her terror. Regardless of her age, whether she was a newlywed whose virginity was doubted or a married woman who'd been caught out in an affair, just imagine the shame and the horror of this moment. She was being publicly dragged through the crowded streets filled with pilgrims in their festive huts, festooned with garlands, dragged through the temple courts, teeming with faithful worshipers, dragged by scribes and Pharisees. They were considered the most righteous of all people in all Judea. Think of her thrust before Jesus, caught in flagrante, her reputation now in shreds, hanging her head in mortification. And to these religious authorities, this woman's life was expendable. She didn't mean a thing to them. All she was was a tool to trap Jesus with. And when Jesus looked at her and at her captors, what, what did he think? What did he see in her heart? What did he see in the men standing before him? I wonder if there was a pause, just a moment. I doubt any of them anticipated what Jesus did next, though. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, for the last 2,000 years, readers have been asking, what did Jesus write? The Greek word that John used is katagrapho, and it could mean anything from scratching to etching to writing to drawing. Jesus writing with his finger actually calls to mind another time when God's finger wrote. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That's in Exodus. Moses talks about it sometime later in Deuteronomy. He says, And the Lord gave me the two stone tablets written with the finger of God. On them were all the words that the Lord had spoken to you at the mountain, out of the fire on the day of the assembly. The second time this happened, it came as a prophetic warning during the prophet Daniel's time when a hand appeared and wrote God's judgment on the wall before the king the night the Persians overtook the Babylonians. And Jesus was writing now on the temple floor's dust. Now, some people think maybe Jesus was alluding to Moses' ritual with that water of bitterness that I described to you. But we can ask, maybe was Jesus writing about the laws concerning adultery? Or maybe like in Prophet Daniel's time, Jesus was writing a warning. Or maybe he was writing a judgment. Some people believe Jesus was writing down the words he was about to speak, as you can see here in this depiction of that scene. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. Jesus may have himself been referring to the law of Moses, which states, But you shall surely kill them. Your own hand shall be first against them to execute them, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Oh, it's possible Jesus may have been writing about each of the sins of those standing before him, so there would be no question he knew they were not qualified to throw that first stone. Here's one thing we can be certain of. All eyes were on Jesus' finger as he wrote, and no longer staring with contempt and calculation at the woman they had so callously used. Just as a bird will feign a broken wing to draw predators away from the nest, so Jesus had drawn attention away from the scribes and Pharisees captive. In fact, as Jesus wrote, 
their gaze turned inward. They were no longer even aware of those around them so much as the truth within them, the truth of their own sinfulness before God. They had come to Jesus with the law of Moses, forgetting the Torah's core theology concerning God's values of justice and righteousness to be written on their hearts. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart, Moses had told the people, and the heart of your descendants, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, in order that you may live. O Lord of hosts, Jeremiah had written, you test the righteous, you see the heart and the mind. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. A new heart I will give you, said Ezekiel, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. As I imagine the scene, I see all those heads lowered, watching Jesus write, who by now is stooped low to the ground. Imagine a great crowd of worshipers in the background going up and down the temple steps. Maybe there's the sound of singing and prayers being chanted. Maybe there's birds and goats and sheep who would have been made available for purchase as sacrifices. But here, in this circle, a great discomfort is growing in their silence. They had come condoning and rationalizing their own sin, while at the same time eager to see sin punished in other people's lives, even to the death, rather than see them forgiven and restored, just to trap Jesus. They had thought to use God's word to trap God. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus had already had a long and heated discourse with the religious rulers when they had accosted him on, about his Sabbath healings. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father, he told them at that time. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Well, that moment of truth had come. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders, and then Jesus was left all alone with the woman standing before him. And at last, the trembling woman stood alone beside her protector and her savior. And now would come her moment of truth, that taste of new life. So let's just remember how this story started out. Jesus had come down from the Mount of Olives early in the morning to teach in the temple courts. And John says all the people came to him. Then scribes and Pharisees arrived with the woman they'd just caught or in, had been apprehended in some way, but they had dragged her in. And it was quite the spectacle. Then as they all pondered Jesus' words in silence, the text says they began to leave one at a time. The elders first. Now, who are the elders? Just the older people? I don't think so. I think this is the scribes and Pharisees. But eventually, everybody left, including those people who had early in the morning come near Jesus so that they could hear him teach. Consider what a rare moment this is. Jesus stood alone. Nobody else is there with this unnamed, accused woman in the middle of the teeming courts of Herod's massive temple where literally tens of thousands of people could gather. But there they stand alone. And you got to ask yourself, why did she stay? Well, the first thing I thought of was, well, maybe she had nowhere else to go. Certainly by now, she's been rejected by her husband and by her parents. And it wouldn't be long before she'd find herself shut out of her community as well. There was little recourse for women in the first century Greco-Roman world. If they had no property or wealth of their own and they were not under the protection of a man in some way, then the prospect of begging or prostitution or indentured servitude or even enslavement would yawn before them. Those were the only prospects she had at this point. But it also seems Jesus had read her heart aright. I think she stayed because she knew she had sinned. And she made no excuse for herself. She didn't try to slip away. She silently owned her guilt before Jesus, acknowledging but also trusting Jesus' authority to decide what was to be done about it. 
So as Jesus finally straightened up, after the last person had left, he must have looked at her with this gentle compassion and and warm concern, and he says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now, did that startle you? His address may sound kind of strange to us today, because woman is not really a very polite thing to call someone, usually, now. But in the Greek, gune, which means woman or wife, was also considered a courteous term, something kind of like our modern-day mistress or lady. Jesus addressed her with the same respectful title he had used with his mother at the wedding of Cana, that he had used with the Samaritan woman, and that he would later use with Mary of Magdala the morning of his resurrection. And it must have astonished her to be spoken to with such gracious honor, especially after her recent treatment. So she said, No one, sir. I wonder if she was prepared for Jesus' response. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on do not sin again. Though it is true Jesus had not contradicted the law, and it is also true Jesus had interpreted the law in a particular way so that it evened the field, so that all stood before God equally in need of the Lord's mercy, What Jesus actually did in this moment is far more profound because Jesus had forgiven the unforgivable. Jesus had forgiven what the law of Moses, written by the finger of God on tablets of stone, did not allow forgiveness for, but only the penalty of death. Jesus had forgiven this guilty woman upon his authority as God the Son. He had declared already his purpose in coming. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This too was in the law of God, in the very character and nature of God as revealed to Moses, spoken of throughout the scriptures, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Jesus had come to give life in abundance, to bring freedom and healing. So Jesus set her free, free from her accusers, free from the penalty of death because of what she'd been caught in, and even free from her own guilt. Jesus has the power to set people free from sin and death. And you know, in a sense, this was the best day of her life. If she hadn't been caught, she would not have had this moment alone with the Lord. Yeah, it was humiliating, it was terrifying, it was devastating. There were going to be consequences from here on out. But Jesus had set her free. Not long after this episode, Jesus would proclaim, If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. His instruction to her was similar to his words to the man he had healed by the pool of Siloam. Go and sin no more. By the same divine authority, Jesus now empowered her to live out his instruction to leave behind the sins of her past and to move forward into a new life that honored God, to live by God's word. I would like to believe this forgiven and freed woman was among those who sang Hosanna to Jesus when he rode into Jerusalem and who was there when the Holy Spirit was poured out onto Jesus' followers. I'd like to think she was among those first 3,000 converts who responded to the gospel, that she was baptized into Christ, and that she joined the many whose lives were being transformed by Jesus. Amen.